Hi guys. Hope everyone's okay. Just type in who you are and uh, your question, hopefully. Hi, Alan. Hope you're okay. Why don't you send me a question now, and I'll do it in order. Uh, questions received, whatever your question is. You can cover any topic tonight, whatever you like. And sorry I'm a bit late, guys. Are we all surviving the lockdown? A bit tougher this one. Short days after Christmas. And all that. Go through the takeaway. Yeah, with pleasure, Adam. No problem at all. That's a, um, I mean, it's a whole lesson itself, the takeaway. Um, you know, Jack Nicholas said it. Uh, that's the part of the swing which really uh, determines the entire swing. So if the takeaway works well, um, then you stand a chance the rest of the swing. It's like anything, isn't it? If it starts well, uh, then you know, you've got a sort of a reasonable chance of the whole sequence uh, building up from there. There's very few players who have quirky um, takeaways. Now, the takeaway really con concerns with the, the position from the golf ball, to that first movement back. Um, and then once that movement back... Uh, once that movement back is uh, established, then the chain of, of, of action from there, the chain, chain reaction from there, um, can be quite smooth, really. And without that sort of decent start, you don't really stand much of a chance. Um, hi, Anthony. Okay. Nice to see you. Where are you coming in from, Anthony? Where are you uh, um, watching us from? And also, what's your question? All right, so it's just about five past now. We'll get cracking in two or three minutes' time. Um, hi, Karen. Nice to see you again. Hope you're okay. Hope you're surviving. Get through the lockdown. Shorter days. No golf. It's very boring for us all, isn't it? Um, no problem, Karen. No, no problem. Um, no problem at all. Okay, so Anthony and Cowan, if you want to type in what your pres uh, what your questions are, uh, then that will uh, set the ball rolling, what we're talking about. I mean, it's quite interesting because Alan's talked about the, the takeaway there. After we set up the ball, that's obviously the most important uh, element of the swing. So that's what we'll start with today. And, of course, everything works out from there. From Catrick, Anthony, and the garrison there. There's a golf course in the garrison, isn't there? A Catrick, Catrick garrison. It's quite a good one, I think. Quite highly regarded. Catrick Garrison Golf Club. All righty. So what I'll do is then I'll wait for Karen and Anthony uh, to put your questions up. Alan's already asked about the takeaway. So the takeaway completely determines the swing. So I set myself up here. Let's close this door. By far the simplest way of um, working on the takeaway is to do what the good players do. And that's move everything back together. So there's a great exercise whereby the pros will stick the butt of the club high into the middle of their body, or even under their left arm here, set themselves up, and then move backwards like this. As you see I'm doing that, what I'm not doing is allowing my hands and arms to work away from the body, 
or I'm not leaving the club in the ground to get my body to work away on its own like that. I'm getting everything to move back as one unit. Now, that's fine for a very short period of the swing here. So now look at the other people coming in. Uh, how do you make a step in the hole is maybe an animal? <laughs> okay. So if we then talk about the, the takeaway from this angle here, for a very short period of the takeaway, this exercise here of having a club into the tummy, or even the left side of the tummy, and then moving back as one unit is a brilliant way about understanding the very first movement of the swing. Because the triangle form between the hands, arms, and shoulders here moves back as one motion here with the club and hands and arms working with the body. So the minute my body turns back like this, the club works with it. But we can't make a golf swing when we just do this. Because at some point, the hands and arms have to separate a little bit away from the body motion. So in terms of the very first motion of the takeaway, what I do is I set myself up to create the best takeaway I can. And that means the left arm the shaft of the club for a left-handed golfer, a right-handed golfer, sits in a straight line here. If the hands sit like this, or like this, in front of the ball, or behind the ball, then that's not great for getting everything established to work as one unit. If they're slightly in front or slightly behind, that's fine. Then what I have is my upper arms, my, my arm here, touching the side of my rib cage here. Yeah? So as I set myself up to the ball here, I don't have my hands and arms miles away from the body. And one of the things we see all the time with, with any sort of golfer, is they tend to stand a bit too far away from the body, have their hands really stretched away from the body. That then means the hands and arms will work quite independently of the body. Yeah. So what we do is we set ourselves up, first of all, left arm shaft the club forward a straight line like this, right hand on the handle, and then from there, that motion is this here. Yeah. The second stage of that motion is that the hands and arms have to move slightly away from the body. So you'll see now as I go back, as I go back to here, my wrist cock and that connection from the butt of the club to my body is lost. So with that half, that's the halfway back position. The starting position is here, and the halfway back position is there. What I'm looking for the halfway back position is a nice new angle between the shaft of the club and my forearm here, and my body to have turned almost through 90 degrees. Now, getting the body to turn through 90 degrees at such an early stage is really difficult. It's quite tricky because we tend to sort of turn our body a little later uh, as, as amateur golfers and sort of uh, not the tour pros. But if you watch most of the tour pros, halfway back, where the shaft of the club is fully cocked, like this, and the left arm of the club is parallel to the ground, their body is more or less out of the way, all the way here. So the right side has gone fully behind the head, right hip and right shoulder has gone fully behind the head. So if we take the takeaway to three distinct sections, one is how we set up to the ball with the left arm and the shaft of the club. That would, that would preset the takeaway. The takeaway itself, moving everything back together, is trying to link the turn of the body, or what I call, not quite the turn, but the right side going behind us here. It's not quite the same thing that as a turn. But I set myself up here, I'm trying to get my right side to push backwards behind me. So as I do push back here, then what I do is, once I make that position there, I cock my wrists, and now I'm in a fully loaded position for power. From there, to get extra power, the full amount of power, I keep turning up the top and swing here. So if we look at the elements of the golf that create power, the first is the right side of the body goes behind us. The second is the arms swing out over here. Then the third thing is that we cock the wrists like that, so a full cock of the wrist here, and those three elements provide the power. If we then turn a little bit more, maintain that little bit of cock action, that nice little cock action there, and turn to there, that's a full backswing. So really, in essence to you, how do you start the takeaway? It's better to start it completely... Hi, Eugene, you all right? Nice to see you. Uh, it's better to start the, um, the movement of the takeaway uh, slowly and smoothly, and certainly well connected. So... Shaft the club, hands, arms, and body, all moving back as one unit, and then move it away slowly. Once that's happened, as we move away slowly, the wrists cock up from there. So, uh, Cohen, you were on next. Uh, remember Richmond, Ned Catrick? Yeah. Uh, so, Cohen, what's your, um, what's your question for me tonight? So, you're talking there about your right hip. You put less uh, weight on it now. There's no problem with that whatsoever. And many of the world's best players actually play on their left side. So if you take your right hip as the, the issue for you here, 
as you set yourself up to the ball here, there's no problem whatsoever in doing two or three quirky things which take the pressure off that right hip. One is moving the right foot forwards or backwards. That might take a bit of pressure off it for you. The most obvious thing to do is to lean slightly more on the left side. That when you make your swing up the top here, your left side carries most of your body weight in the motion. Now, one of the worst things you can do in a golf swing is start here and sway across. So if you end up sort of pushing pressure on that right hip by moving across like this, that's a bad position for the swing anyway. No good player does that. All good players put that right hip behind them. They don't let it slide out to the side of the golf swing over here. So they'll set themselves up here to here. Now, in your case, if you're, if you're dealing with a, 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 a problem in your right hip, then position your feet, you might take a narrower stance as well and lean side on the left side. You might take a wider stance and lean on the left side. Now, if you lean on the left side, you might want to put a bit more pressure on the left knee and put a bit more bend in the left knee. And again, that'll take a bit of the pressure off that right side there. So you, your swing might be slightly uh, uh, asymmetric, so your legs will have a slightly different position there, but there's nothing wrong with that. So if you set yourself up with the ball here, if you're pressing that left foot down, you're more or less pressing down into the position you're going to hit the ball anyway with your irons. With the driver, it's a slightly different thing. So if I had a right, ish, right hip issue here, yeah, I don't want to sort of use that right hip too much. I'd be withdrawing the right hip on the right side, pushing it back here and taking a bit of pressure off of it. Add the ball forward in the stance, and then try and hit the ball on the way up a little bit with the driver. Yeah? So you're taking the pressure away from that right side. Okay, so Karen's saying there, I'm struggling with transferring my weight to the right leg on the takeaway. So I've just sort of more or less covered that and starting the downswing with my lower body and the arms tend to start and take over. So what you're talking about there really is a timing issue um, of coordinating the hands, arms and body with the, uh, uh, with the swing of the club. So let me go through your, um, your question here in a bit more detail. What I'm struggling with is transferring my weight to the right leg on the takeaway. You don't need to transfer your leg, uh, your weight to the leg on the, the right leg on the takeaway. Now, when we talk about transferring the weight, the weight does move around, but not quite as one-dimensionally as we might think if we just look at swing from face on. So if I look face on to a golf swing here like this, you think, oh, do I get my weight to my right side and then to my left side? Well, you actually don't in a golf swing. What you're trying to do is put your weight on the way back onto your right heel. So the golf swing weight distribution is we set up as we do here, we pull back to the right heel, swing down, and then pull through to the left heel like this. So we don't want to think one dimension on the, on the body transfer. It doesn't go side to side like this, because that'll put pressure on the hip, and doesn't really get the hip into a position for power. When I set up the ball here, I'm trying to put my right side behind me, like this. So now you see that my right hip actually goes this way behind me. I'm going to show you a picture now. We just sent to the scratch team of my club the other day. And it's actually a fabulous photo. Which is quite surprising in many ways. Let me try and find out my feed here. Okay, here we go. Now this is a golfer from 120 years ago. It's Harry Varden. Let me try and get it slightly out of the light for you. Oops, can't quite get the light right. There we go, that's better. So he's hit the ball. And look how his left leg is really straight, but also leaning quite a long way behind the shot. That's, like I say, it's a very one-dimensional uh, picture, that. It's obviously one photograph taken from behind, quite an unusual angle. But what it demonstrates to you there is when we talk about weight transfer, he isn't transferring his weight left and right in the conventional way, which uh, I understood your question there, Cohen. His weight's going very much towards his left heel. So his left heel on the ground right here you can see it's spun around. So the weight's very much on the heel on the outside of the foot. So as he's swinging there, if I show you that from behind, he's hit that shot, followed right through, and he's here, isn't he? His weight's right behind his, uh, his buttock and going that way in the swing. So he's pulled it this way in the swing. So he hasn't necessarily done what you think he's done, Cohen, by going side 
to the side, that isn't the weight transfer and all swing. The weight transfer and all swing is setting up to the ball and putting the right side behind us. We then swing down to the ball and the weight of the body moves forwards towards the toes. We then hit the ball and the weight to the left side, as I'm just showing that pitch there, pulls back that way. Yeah? We don't move side to side with the golf swing. Now I can tell you now, Cohen, that I teach loads of people an exercise of hitting the golf ball with their feet stuck together. So that would be the ultimate uh, uh, way of uh, uh, feeling that you don't need to do lots of weight transfer in the swing. Uh, it would definitely make you feel to uh, make you feel that um, the body weight goes actually this way rather than this way in the swing. And that's when people say keep your head still. Is it correct in some ways? We don't have the head moving side to side, but we have a little bit of head up and down as the body weight moves and shifts behind us on the backswing. So, anybody got any questions? Just type them in into the bar here. Uh, let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what your questions are. Cohen uh, uh, talked there about the. Um, the transfer of the weight onto the right leg. And it's one of those things which um, I never talk about in the golf class. I never talk to people about uh, um, weight transfer. Uh, what I'll talk about is the balance in the swing. Um, it's, so I kind of just saying that sometimes he sways. I'll talk about the balance in the swing. I'll talk about the weight movement in the swing. I won't talk about weight transfer because weight transfer to me would mean you know, moving from one side to the next. But like I say, the weight transfer actually goes forwards and backwards rather than side to side. So lots of the great pros set themselves up to the ball. And you'll see them on the TV. That's a bit like this. So that right foot's pulled back a little bit. They're in here. And the weight is set up this way from the right heel to the left toe. And that tells you the direction of travel they're trying to get into there. Yeah? If I wanted to move my weight side to side here, I'd splay my feet out, and that would give me a motion that way. But that's not, doesn't even look like a golf swing, does it? Now, if I make that motion there, you don't see good players doing that. You see good players doing that motion there. So, Cohen, you just, you just uh, made a follow up to that uh, question there. Sometimes I sway, which I try not to, because turn the right hip gets uncomfortable. Well, exactly, that's my point, really, because whatever I weigh, if I weigh 10 units here, and I sway across, onto that right hip, then I put another pressure onto it. Now, if you've got any tender part of the body, any, any I mean, Jean's a doctor, but any, any uh, professional uh, will tell you that your body will deal with being a body first before it deals with being um, uh, a golf swing uh, 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 mechanical uh, position first. Hi, Kiefer. And so, um, great question, by the way. Um, so what you have then is you have uh, uh, positions in the body which if your body can't get into, it won't get into. It won't put you into pressure or stress or sort of uh, uh, risk of injury if your body's not capable of it. And I remember spending a day with Pete Cowan, who uh, he's coached many, many of the world's top players. And uh, he said that he'd once had a player on tour and they were both determined to work on something which um, they thought was correct for this person's swing. And they were really struggling with it. They just couldn't seem to get to the bottom of uh, why he couldn't do it. And they tried all sorts of different techniques and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, implements and video camera and all the sort of track on the heavy data stuff. And they were saying, well, how can we not get uh, this position? Anyway, they worked so hard because these guys are obsessive uh, as well. And so they worked so, so hard uh, to achieve this. At the end of injuring the player, as the player got injured and he couldn't play for a while, and then after a long period of time, they worked out and, and uh, I got a specialist to check him over. And he had a physical injury on one part of his body, which meant his, his body hit, it meant that he couldn't actually make the swing position they were trying to achieve anyway. So the problem was his body in the first place. They then put pressure on his body to try and achieve something it wasn't capable of doing. The body then broke down. And of course, you know, it's, it, when the, those guys are out of work uh, for that length of time, it cost them money, it cost them points, it cost them their next season, really. So you've got to be so cautious of, of doing what your body's capable of and what it's not capable of. And the world's best players end up swinging in a manner which their body can do, not just the, the, the sort of manner which they would love to be able to do or try and ape a swing or copy a swing or try and sort of get into inverted commas perfect positions. What they're trying to do in their swing is make the most effective movement. So then, uh, that's Council Kiva. Do you have a shot routine that you use for every single shot? So, as you know, Dai, uh, one of the other coaches, uh, there's three of us, Alistair, Dai, and myself. Uh, Dai is very big on a pre shot routine, PSR, he calls it. Um, and, you know, Dai works with some of the world's top players over the years. 
Uh, and he talks about pre-shot routine all the time. And Dai was one of the very first, uh, in my chair, Dai was one of the very first pros to ever get into um, the deep psychology of the swing. And he worked with a chap called Alan Fine, who was very much at the cutting edge of trying to get people to think about the mental side of the swing, uh, the mental side of the game and all their sort of preparation, their planning and all their, um, their on-course behaviour, their conduct, how they spoke to themselves. And that's a big part of, uh, of understanding the psychology of the game. And so Dai really got into this pretty short routine thing. Now, when you watch the golf on the telly, how often do you see them time the best players in the world's uh, routine and say, well, it's a few seconds faster there. Normally it takes 11 seconds. At that time, it took 12 or 13. And there's a very famous case of um, Colin Montgomery, uh, who should have won the US Open. And he hit a brilliant drive down the middle of the fairway in the 18th hole of the final round. And uh, he had a shot into the green, which is bread and butter shot. It was a perfect shot game. Colin Montgomery moved the ball from the left to the right. So he played a big fade. And then what he'd do, and the flag on that hole was, was tucked in the right-hand corner. It was a perfect shot from the perfect uh, angle for him to bend his ball into the target. And he seemed to spend ages and ages and ages over the ball, much longer than he would do ordinarily. Uh, and he had a terrible shot um, as a consequence of sort of just losing his natural routine. So uh, the, 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 the sort of blanket answer to that would be, yes, you should have a pre-shot routine for every single shot but every single shot is different. You know, the needs of a drive and the needs of an iron and the needs of a, a bunker shot are quite different. So this is where you start then getting into, is your rehearsal swing of any value? Do you make a practice swing? How many should you make? Um, and what should you be trying to achieve with that rehearsal swing? Now, with a driver, when I make my rehearsal swing, what I do, this is before I make my pre-shot routine, by the way. What I then do is I try and make a big wind up. So pull my right foot back a little bit to really increase the range of my body. I make some big swings here, trying to kind of stretch in the club out, making huge swings with the driver. With an iron club, I don't need that same width and size and space in the swing. And so my rehearsal swing will be slightly more crisp, a bit short, a bit smoother. I'll try and make contact with the grass because obviously when the ball's on the grass with it, without a, a, a tee peg on the iron, I'm trying to make contact with the ground. And with a chipping shot, I'm going to stand close and make a rehearsal swing, which is just smaller and more delicate and more rhythmical. So that part of the pre-shot routine definitely wouldn't be um, the same free shot. Now, when I uh, learned the game, Nick Faldo was the best player in the world. And so me and all my mates uh, all uh, copied what Faldo's mannerisms were before he hits the shot. And Faldo was very sort of uh, fidgety. He'd throw his arm out, he'd pull his trousers up and hitch the next one up. He set himself up, he had a really sort of extended waggle here, he shuffle, then he move his head and swing back. So we all sort of copied that, because we also wanted to be the best player in the world, we're trying to copy him. Half, half the, well, I'd say the similar generation was Cedric Ballester, he had a very different routine. He'd sort of walk in with one hand, and then he'd walk in, and he'd set himself up, and he'd shuffle side to side, and he'd grit his teeth, and of course all the fans have said we'll do the same thing as that. So those sorts of elements of pre-shot routine are actually a brilliant way of learning the game. Because if you can sort of think creatively, and if you can think uh, like you're mimicking somebody and put on an act, uh, like the best players in the world have done themselves, and don't forget every tour pro is a child inside. Every single one of them is a child mimicking the best players in the world that they grew up with. And there's loads of examples of uh, guys now on the tour who are in their 20s saying, oh, I remember watching Tiger when he was young. He was amazing. You know, I, I tried everything that he does. And, of course, they swing similarly to Tiger. They had the same sort of mannerisms and the same sort of way of doing things. So in terms of uh, your rehearsal swing, starting where the pre-shot routine starts, uh, I would definitely look at a player you like. And if you're a brisk player, you might, you'll might you pick a, a quick player who picks the club up quickly, waggles it around quickly, moves in quickly. If you're a bit more methodical and you like sort of a bit more precision, then you won't do that. You'll find a player who does something slightly differently. So then in terms of the pre-shot routine, and this is where Dai is very strict, is you have to point that club face on target. So the first thing you do when you set yourself up to the ball, and you watch Garcia do this all the time, he places the club down behind the ball and he spends ages twisting it around getting shot for you until it's absolutely square to the target. Then what Garcia does, you know, Masters champion, he places his hands on the handle very securely, very delicately. And then once he's done that, he positions his feet to the ball here. Yep. Now preceding that, they all look at the target down this way here. 
Now, you're going to know this better than I will, as a serviceman. If you had a set of binoculars and you're looking at something, you would look at it this way to get the best view of the way you want to look. Yeah. You simply wouldn't hold your binoculars this way and look at something. It doesn't make any sense, does it? If I was to look at you now, that would be a very peculiar angle with my binoculars, whereas that would be a very correct angle with binoculars. So when they're hitting a shot that way, the first thing they'll do is stand here, have a good look at it from behind, and Dai is very key on this as well, standing from behind here. Then walk in, that's my Garcia point, where he places the club face down behind the ball very precisely. Sets himself up, club face goes in, and then hands on the handle. And then once he's done that, positions the body where his ball position is, and then pronounce the about his swing. Now, where I position my hands on the handle completely determines the angle of the face, doesn't it? You know, so I can't move my hands around here, you know, a few inches without having some impact on the club's face there. So what you're trying to do all the time is get your hands in a position which limit the twist on the face there. And that's where Garcia is so strict. This is an old, the first thing, one of the first things we learn as a PJ professionals is the club goes down squarely behind the ball, then the glove hand goes on, left hand goes on, then the right hand goes on. Yeah. So if Garcia is still doing that, I think Garcia's dad's a PGA pro. And so if his dad's a PGA pro and he taught him that from years ago, um, and Garcia is still doing it, it just shows how those simple uh, mechanical uh, needs have not really changed that much. And if one of the world's best players still does all that very strict routine, then your question keeper is very apt because they're doing something which they can rely on all the time. It's repetition. It's doing the same thing over and over again. It becomes their standard way of doing things. Uh, and they can rely on that. So, in answer to your question, uh, I'd find a pre-shot routine, um, and one of the best tips I ever got as a kid was go to the range and try out a, a few rehearsals. You know, find out what you can do, find out what you've got the patience for, find out what you think is uh, efficient rather than... But really what you're trying to do is stand behind it. Oops. So my connection's unstable. What it's saying is... Uh, what I say is... Uh, I think I lost the connection slightly there. Is stand behind it, have a good look at it, then walk around 90 degrees. So you've stood behind it, first of all, have a look at your target, then walk round to your ball, and then set yourself up. And the same thing applies to your putting, you know, in terms of pre-shot routine. So you're asking me the question, is, is your pre-shot routine the same for all, all the shots that you hit? On a putt, we get down our haunches, we have a good look at it, have a look behind. And that's the best view, a view in which to sort of think, well, that's the bend on the putt and what have you. By the time you've sort of done that, let's say I'm putting towards you now, I'm still behind them. I'm going to look at my ball to roll this way. By the time I come around here, set myself up over the putt and have a look at it, it might look very different. But this is a very poor way of looking at your target. Whereas this is a very accurate way of looking at your target. So a pretty shot routine for a putting shot uh, is based on this here. What's the best view for me to see from the ball to the target? It's from here. It simply isn't by the time we stand over the ball and look at it from here. So I think what you've got to do, Keith, is find a pre-shot routine which uh, you feel comfortable with, something which you feel like you can do, um, and doesn't feel like you're sort of taking too much time or faffing about, um, and be efficient. And really, if you can sort of trim your, your pre-shot routine down, that's a great tip as well. Don't, don't be a slow player. Um, I'm going to turn the lights off behind me. I just think it seems to be glaring at the camera. Now, if you can be a brisk player, uh, it's all the better for you. Um, and the brisker you are, yeah. really, um, the brisker you are, the sort of the, the more clean and clear your thought process will be. Uh, okay, so Anthony said, "Will the left knee replacement change my swing? I am a below right leg amputee." So just re just clear it up for me, Anthony. You're having a left knee replacement as well, and you currently have a, a below right leg amputee. So, um, will the left knee replacement? Yeah, the left knee replacement will change your swing. There's no doubt about it, um, because anything which is uh, above the knee. Um, nice penguins, by the way. <laughs> my daughter's or my son's. Um, a left knee replacement will, will change your swing. There's no doubt about it, and so prepare yourself for that. Um, I mean, you'll know this better than me, but anything which is below the knee has much less impact than uh, above the knee. Um, 
so if you're uh, already uh, uh, below right knee, by, below right leg amputee, that that doesn't tend to inhibit our ability to coach you at all. Uh, I've never seen anybody with a below uh, below knee right leg um, amputee um, have anything other than a perfectly able uh, golf swing. With uh, that's the only uh, injury you have. Now the left knee replacement will be slightly different on that. I can't wait to meet you at one of the events to have a good look at what you're doing there, yeah. and it might be worthwhile. You send me a WhatsApp video of your swing. Uh, I can send you my mobile number. Anybody, anybody can do this, by the way. I'm a bit behind on uh, my WhatsApp videos, but uh, send me a video of your swing. Uh, but yes, the, the left knee um, uh, replacement will change your swing. Depends how long you're out for as well, of course. Uh, hopefully you're not out for too long. Um, but I think you, as I was saying to you before, you'll have a situation whereby you'll, you'll need to get used to being uh, a different body part and a change to your, uh, your your structure and what have you get used to that. And it will, of course, change your swing and how you feel in your swing as well. So um, I certainly don't see your right leg as being a problem at all. If your left leg uh, is uh, full, i.e. no amputee, uh, no amputation on it, uh, and you get a left knee replacement, then I can't see that being a problem either, really, uh, in that sense. It'll change things a little bit, but I can't see it being a, a massive issue, a massive problem for you. I really can't. Um, but like I say, send me a video of your swing or, 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 or just let me know uh, what you think. Um, okay, Cohen, I feel like what is happening with the pro I see for lessons at the moment, great guy, but I feel like he is trying to get me to swing perfectly rather than work with my limitations and change. Whew, we've all been there, both as pupils and as coaches. And uh, what was, what's great about what you just said there, I mean, he's obviously trying to get you to swing as well as he can. There's no doubt about that. And so his intentions are really good. And uh, he's clearly um, using the reference point of the best swings and the, and the best way of swinging as a way to get you there. So your commitment to that is to say, well, I have limitations. I'll try my hardest to get there. And then he'll work with you and you'll work with him. And you'll say, okay, well, uh, can do this, can't do that. And that limitation there uh, means that you know, we can't achieve that perfect position. And so oftentimes in the middle of a lesson I'm uh, uh, with somebody, I will say to them, I say, look, you know, we've tried that. It's not working. Either I can't get the message across to you or there's something which means that you can't uh, do it. So let's let's uh, agree a compromise. I'll give you an example. One of my favourite uh, uh, um, chaps I teach now, Richard, uh, bends his arm a lot. Very good player, single-figure handicapper. Uh, bends his arm a lot. We've tried everything to get him into perfect positions, which he can do in a rehearsal swing. They can do when we're sort of, practicing a little bit in that position here when the ball's there um, um, he, he bends his arm quite a bit so we came to a compromise where we said look you can't bend it that much you, you, you're not able to, to make yourself do that there so if we have a little bit in the middle that's fine so we set ourselves a little target of saying well if it's for argument's sake 60 degrees of bend then we're okay with that so I think your uh, input into a lesson is valuable uh, vital I beg your pardon as it is with everybody who comes for a lesson and if you think you can't do something because your body is uh, damaged, injured, or in recovery or rehab, um, or just doesn't feel comfortable, then you just say, listen, mate, you can't do that. Yeah, Because his, his starting point is how can I get this guy to swing the best? He's obviously pushing you hard, which, is, which I think is a brilliant uh, attribute to a coach. He wants the best out of you. Um, but you might be standing there saying, you know what, mate? You can't really feel what I'm feeling here. You know, you, you can see, you think I'm capable of doing it, but I don't think I am. Uh, and so it's up to you then to put a stop on that. If he doesn't listen after that, then, you know, I think you go and get a fresh pair of ears. And I spent a week with Butch Harmon, uh, just as he was tied, just as he's finished being Tiger Woods' his coach. And what did he say to me? Why did I say that then? He said, um, oh, God, why did I say that? Why did I say that? I lost my train of thought. Oh, that's what he said. He said, listen, he said, if somebody stops coming to you as a pro, we went 12 pros basically had a week with Butch Harmon. So we had breakfast, lunch and dinner with them. And we spent the evenings with them and sort of picking their brains and like, you know, like you guys are, you're hungry for information, you know, like, like we are, we all are. We sort of try to pick uh, people's brains, just try to get a little bit better. Um, and we're saying, you know, picking his brains. He said, listen, he said, if someone stops taking lessons off me and some of the world's best players have stopped taking lessons off Butch Harmon, even if they've been doing great winning tournaments. He said it's happened to him in the past where someone's won a major tournament and then two weeks later, they say, oh, I don't want to take lessons with you anymore, but you want to go to somebody else, I want to get a different perspective. And he thinks, well, it took, it took him years. He was saying, look, here I am, 
I've done what he wanted me to do. I've got him swinging better. He's now one of the best players in the world. And he's stopping taking lessons with me. What, what's going on sort of thing? And he said, listen, he said, every one of us is a student of the game. We are all students of the game. And a fresh pair of eyes, a fresh pair of ears is never a bad thing. Now, sometimes the choice to go for a fresh pair of ears and a fresh pair of eyes might be a bad one. The pro you're with at the moment might be the best one you'll ever find, the best one who gels with you. But there's nothing wrong with you uh, going to another pro and saying, look, I said, I'm really enjoying my lessons my current pro, but we've hit a little bit of a crossroads. Can you give me a fresh perspective? And that pro will probably say, that's great. I love this now because I've got a bit of a challenge on my hands here. Not only does he want me to repair and fix his swing, but also he wants me to sort of clarify if he's on the right path. So the worst thing you can do is sort of uh, be dogmatic and think you've got to keep doing something, uh, even though your body can't do it. Some things take longer than others. I watched Bryson DeChambeau the other day and a video giving lessons to his mate. Uh, and he was saying, uh, look, you've got to work at it, you know, just stick at it. You know, it takes time, these things. And he was right. You know, there's a guy, uh, listen, the tour pros hit balls for 12 hours a day. You know, they haven't got it perfectly honed uh, uh, exactly how they want it to be. So that's why they practice. So things just take longer than others. So a fresh pair of eyes, fresh pair of ears, fresh perspective, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, now, I used to, I've just left my uh, my current club at Rahampton, uh, and I had eight professionals there, eight system pros. And... I always said to every single one of them, I said, listen, if someone comes in for a lesson with you and then next week they come and lesson with somebody else, that's their choice as a golfer. They're a student. They want to study the game and learn the game and they might just be coming because they want a fresh perspective on what you've talked about. Yep. Now, they might have that next lesson with another coach and hate it and say, you know what, God, what was I thinking? That other approach I went, the pro I went to last week was miles better and they'll come back to you. But people have to get themselves um, comfortable with their coach comfortable with the, with the message from their coach and it's a two-way street i can tell you now and my pros and i would talk about this all the time if you've got someone in a lesson who isn't talking to you it's a hard lesson because they hit a good shot they don't say anything you say well any good you, you like that yeah it's a good shot okay and they hit another shot bad shot no reaction you think well um yeah how did that feel sort of thing and yeah well, not great yeah, so that's very hard for us to deal with as coaches. And most coaches, and, you, and I picked up on it a book before you said, uh, I feel like, uh, but that's happening with the pro at the minute, is that he wants to make me a perfect swing rather than uh, with the work of limitations. He's a great guy. You know, lots of pros are sort of likable and sort of uh, will want to be friends with you and sort of want to get to know you, to, not just to make you better at golf, but they sort of got a, an outgoing personality and um, want to get to know you. So... I, it sounds like he's a good guy. He just might have got to a little bit of a paint himself into a corner whereby uh, he needs a bit more from you, whereby you say, look, mate, I can't do that. Um, and he'll change his, his thought process very quickly. And if he doesn't, then, like I say, it's, uh, it's probably a bit dogmatic, really. Um, all righty, so what's the next question? Uh, Anthony's ready to start playing now. All right, so you've had the left knee replacement. All right, so just um, while I'm talking, Anthony, just let me know how that feels to you, that left knee replacement. Um, do you feel like it's made a massive change to the way you walk, uh, the pressure you can put on it? Does it change any of the other sort of uh, uh, joints above or below it? Um, do you feel like it's limiting you more, giving you a fresh lease of life? Uh, my dad had two uh, knee replacements, uh, and it, you know, in his, in about 71, 72 when he had them. It's the best thing he ever did. Gave him a fresh lease of life. And I must say as well, the amount of uh, civilians that I teach who go for hip, knee, ankle operations and come out you know, six after their rehab, and they're miles better. They're just so much fitter, stronger, healthier. They've taken away the problem. Uh, and I really fingers crossed for you there, um, uh, Anthony, because I hope that your, uh, hip operation, your left knee operation uh, uh, is a success for you because uh, it will give you a fresh lease of life. There's no doubt about it. Um, so just let me know what you think you're feeling at the minute, uh, if there are any limitations on it. You've got my number there, and you can send me a swing video anyway. Okay, Cohen, is it worth swinging the club in the garden, even though I'm not hitting a ball? Absolutely, but not at full speed. It's the weirdest thing, and I can't explain the reason for what I'm about to describe to you. Uh, but it actually, if I swing my club in my garden, I love swinging the club in the garden. I'm always fiddling around. I'm always trying to find the next sort of uh, magical thing that makes me find another 20 yards or hit the ball a bit straighter. But when I'm in my garden swinging, if I swing at full speed, it hurts. Something happens in my hands. And I think the uh, uh, maybe uh, it might be psychosomatic because the ball's not there. I sort of, I'm expecting a hit. It doesn't happen. And uh, I don't know. It just sort of feels like I'm missing something. 
but what I do when I'm swinging in the garden um, is I'll swing with two or three clubs, build up my golf strength. And golf strength is such a, an underrated uh, value. You know, if I teach a, a kid or a little old lady and they're sort of bombing the ball might, it's because they're golf strong. They play the golf game a long time. They develop that sort of speed and power in their hands. You know, let me tell you what golf strength is, right? Watch this here. Boy, that's going to hurt. Now, you do not need to be muscle man to get that smack to hurt. Watch this here. That really hurts the back of my hand. It's a square smack. Now that's goal strength. So if I the left handed one here in slow motion, this slap here in slow motion, what do I do? I just bend that elbow. I don't move my body around. Yeah? Just bend that elbow. The most important thing I do to create the power is I rotate it a full 90 degrees. Now those two elements, the rotation combined with that lever here, that is a smack. Let me tell you, that really hurts. Yeah? So that power I'm creating there is real golf strength. Now you look at good players with golf strength, it's because the hands can move the club freely. It's not because the hands are massive or strong or pumped up forearms, it's because they've got mobility in the hands there. You watch me here with my hands, if I split my hands, everything goes a bit wobbly. Now my hands haven't lessened their uh, uh, strength there, they've just lessened the power. So I said, I should put my uh, iPad on charge in case I need it later on. While we're talking, one second. So, say there. So if I learn to move the hands loosely and freely, boy, do I put life into that club. That club has so much power and energy now. So if I was out swinging the garden, two or three clubs in my hand, I really get the feeling of that heavy club building up my goal strength. I spend an awful lot of time wiping the club around in the garden, like this. Holding it lightly. I'm wiping the club. Yeah. Next thing I do, put the club in here. I never stop working on this. I've done this all my life, really. I just get the motion of the club, the hands and the body moving backwards and forwards. Now, another thing which is a great thing to do is look at yourself um, in a patio window or a kitchen window or a mirror, whatever you've got outside, um, and just keep looking at your swing. Because if you look at it, you feel what you're seeing. So as I set myself up here now and swing up, to here, I know one of my big areas in my swing is I tend to take the club more around here. The swing back, I sort of put the club too far behind my shoulder here. So when I look at myself in a video, or look at myself in a mirror, or the kitchen window when I'm outside, I'll swing and I'll feel my hands traveling over the shoulder here. That's a great reference point for me. So all the stuff that I'm working on, obviously I've got the, the data bank of knowledge to, to work it out, but I'm looking and feeling all the time. Now, you're all very intelligent, big-thinking guys. Every, every, every time I go to a, an on-course event, uh, we bristle off your energy because we know you're thinking all the time. You want to hear about the technique all the time. There's obviously some part of your technical and your physical and your professional training which makes you think analytically. You obviously train that way. So if I was you, even though you're not professional golfers, I'd be setting myself up here. And when I'm swinging back and looking at myself in the mirror, I try and fiddle around and say, well, hang on a minute. That position there looks much better than what I did here. And I wonder why. And try and work it out yourself. Have your iPad with pictures of pros and the swings that you like on display. So if you have a particular pro who has a similar build to you or has a swing style that you like, try and mimic that swing. I can tell you now, every single teaching product like myself has spent hours and hours and hours of their lives, you know, thinking the Seve, thinking the Tiger Woods and what have you. Not quite getting there. Um, okay. Uh, so Anthony says, ready to play, start playing now. You then typed in your response. That's good. Um, Cohen says, I think no experience like you and the OCF coach is doing you guys. I sort of fell into this by, uh, by accident, really. I got so obsessed with uh, coaching the On Course Foundation. And John Simpson was brilliant because he'd set up this idea of uh, coaching the servicemen. He spoke to me about it. I said, oh, great. Well, I'm, I'm only 45 minutes from Headley Court. Um, uh, you know, when if the servicemen come to me, I'll do the coaching sort of thing. So very quickly, I loved the challenge of it. Not only I was I'm a patriot, so I loved dealing with uh, a serviceman in the first place. Um, you know, both my grandparents served and what have you. Um, and so for me, it's a massive uh, interest level. 
uh, in that. And the second thing was that uh, it was very challenging. You know, as golf pros, we think, well, you know, if all of a sudden you've got someone who's got amputee legs, amputee arms, disfigured or badly injured arms and body or eyesight problems or anything, we all of a sudden had to um, really start thinking creatively and to get this to work for you. And so we've loved it. Uh, so in answer to your question there about the experience of doing it, um, what I would say after doing this for now for 12 years is that the input from you guys about how you feel physically is massive to us. It's absolutely huge. So if you say, listen, mate, that really hurts, then we will stop doing it. Yep. And so the pro you're working on with or with any pro that you're working on, um, the input you give them is vital for them to do a proper job for you. Uh, so we've been in the garden, we've done that. Uh, waiting for a hip replacement, some of those, and I'm not saying I'm worried about it if it leads back my golf in a negative way. Mate, like I said to you before, any replacement, be it hip, knee, ankle, shoulder, what have you, I would say 99% of the time is a massive success rate for your golf. No doubt about it. You'd be very, very unlucky, very unfortunate. And it's all very well for me to say this and be cavalier and, you know, I'm not sort of dealing with what you're dealing with. Uh, I'm just looking at from the other side of the fence as a golf pro and someone who deals with civvies all the time who um, uh, just get older and, you know, things need replacing and changing and what have you. And guys like you've had the trauma uh, and why you've had to have stuff changed. I've never seen, that's not, very rarely have I seen it not work out. Um, and if it hasn't worked out, then it's, it's, it's repaired the next time around. So there's the, the, just a delay to the success. If I'm, I'm in totally blunt, blunt with you there as well, totally honest. So Anthony, you're saying it's amazing, no pain. Balance is not there yet. Uh, and it's not the same. Mo movement is not the same. Um, if you've got a garden or an open space you can go into, just get swing, but swing slowly. Yeah, you know, get to feel your body again, get to feel and learn your, your movements. Um, you know, it's a lot of the stuff that we've we, listened. We've all learned a tremendous amount. All of us die, Alistair and myself. Um, but I remember one of the sort of big impact lessons that we had was, was a, um, an arm amputee who said he kept an itchy hand on his arm, which had been amputated. And so we thought, well, now how, because obviously his brain is, is still trying to process uh, the loss of a, a limb or what have you. And so he stood in front of a mirror, got a mirror image of himself, and scratched on a, a corner of a chair or something the, the hand which he still had remaining. And that relieved the scratch in the missing hand. And so um, he was learning to get to know his body again. And so that was a big message for us. I remember sitting there with Di that night and thinking, oh, we've learned an awful lot there. You know, that, that sort of 20-second um, story from it. And we've learned how your body starts to react. So uh, if there's no pain, that's obviously the number one thing. Your body can now deal with um, uh, all sorts of things. It can deal with, with going back to a sort of what you were before. Um, but the movement's not there. So it, it, it sounds to me balance is not there, and yet the movement is not the same. So if the balance isn't there yet, then, then obviously there's going to be some brain training, I would think, to take place whereby your body gets used to, your brain gets used to uh, that new um, feeling or position or what have you. Obviously, any exercise that you're doing is going to be a benefit. Any movement and walking that you're doing. Lee Westwood does no cardio exercise whatsoever. And he's fit, by the way. He's, he's a strong man. Uh, he lifts weights in the gym and does no cardio. And he says, uh, my cardio is on the golf course. I walk four or five miles a day, seven days a week. So why do I need to go and stand on a bloody treadmill or go on a, you know, a, a jog or anything like that? So in your case, um, I would say any form of movement which you're getting, you're getting used to your body again will no doubt will improve your, your, your balance and your movement and your range within that body part, uh, within that uh, uh, part of your body there. Um, and then, yeah, you say now that you're going to sort of uh, swing in your garden with the lights on, fantastic, fantastic exercise that. That is worth much more than going to the driving range. I assure you, getting to know your swing. Um, what are you doing now that you left Roehampton? Um, so I'm setting up a big indoor golf uh, facility in London, hopefully in London, um, where we can do coaching uh, and do the whole sort of uh, golf simulator thing. I'm obsessed by tech, as you know, um, and so that's the next stage for me, um, doing that. I can't wait. Got some good backing from some great people um, and uh, spoke to Alistair Mackay Forbes and John Simpson uh, two weeks ago to say how much involvement the On Course Foundation would have in that if I get things uh, done properly. Um, so fingers crossed, um, there'll be a, a, a big involvement for the course there in terms of uh, helping out, in terms of using the place and in terms of employment. That's what we do. Alrighty, any more questions, guys? Anything else you want to talk about? Any other parts of the game, not necessarily the technical part of the swing or what have you? But anything which we talked about which you want a bit more clarity on? Or anything which... Uh, 
in these discussions. In fact, who sent me a video the other night? Swinging really well. Uh, let me have a look. But we can go through this one together if you, if you fancy it. All right, so Mahindra, isn't it? Now, they get this right. So Mahindra, Mahindra had sent me a message the other night. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, hope all is well, Rich. Send me a, a, a WhatsApp message. That's the best way of doing it. Um, uh, uh, what do I think of Tiger's latest surgery? I mean, he's got the best advice and the best uh, surgeons in the world. Um, he's just an incredibly fit man. And so, you know, you can't, you can't damage fat in your body. You can't pull fat, but you can pull a muscle, can't you? The fit these guys are, the more sort of damage they're going to do. And so he's put his body under intense strain. He's an athlete. Uh, it's incredibly driven. So... I guess he's going to have the best surgeons in the world, and good luck to him. You know, the, game's, the game has benefited so much by uh, Tiger's uh, just presence, really. So get this right. So Mahindra says, my best driver's speed is 109 miles an hour. And that's tour professional standard, let me tell you. Not the top tour professionals, but you know a lot of good players uh, do that. So then he said, uh, send me a swing position. So let me show you a swing, first of all. You watch this here. Let me get it here. Second, right over here. Now, boy, oh boy, is he giving that a ride? 109 miles an hour? I mean, that's fast, let me tell you. I mean, if I hit balls in my uh, studio, it will take me 20 minutes of warming up to get to 109 miles an hour. I mean, that is fast. Andrew's a strong man, right? Okay, now here's down the line. Here's the one with face on. Here's down. Look at that for a really relaxed setup. Now, I can tell you now, if you watch this later on at 52, 53, through 53 minutes of our video tonight, that's how you set up to a golf ball. Really relaxed. And look how he's moving that body. That is superb. So, if I then look at what his question was, he wants to uh, improve more. Now, if he's already at tour professional standard, he should be shooting tour professional scores. He's then saying to me, he says, thank you, Richard. I do not have any flexibility to my left ankle. Now, you'd never know that, would you, right? And the bottoms of my left feet and my right forearms are broken. He's carrying the ball 242 yards. Now, this is where it gets interesting now, because this is where the numbers have become really sort of revealing. So he's saying to me, his best swing speed is 109 miles an hour, but he's only counting 242. Now, really, 109 miles an hour should be yielding... So every mile an hour is worth two and a half. So let me just do some maths here. That's about 250, 268, isn't it? Let me have a look. Okay, so he got 109 times 2.5. He should be carrying the ball 272 and a half yards. So this is where we are starting into the mathematics of the game now. If he's carrying the distance 242, he's losing a good 30 yards. And that's down to quality of strike. And this is where you guys are really going to focus because if you want to optimize your strength, your speed and the, the distance that you hit the ball, then finding the sweet spot of the club is where it matters. Every quarter of an inch you miss the very center of the club, you know, you lose 7% distance. Every half an inch is 14% distance. So your swing uh, can be as fast and as powerful and as sort of meaty and as strong as you like. Yeah. But if you're missing the part of the club where the club flies most powerfully, then you're really going to struggle. So here's an exercise for you. If you go online, you can buy what's called airflow balls. So if Anthony, if you're going into the uh, light somewhere in the garden, you can buy an airflow ball, a two pound for like six balls. And they're just basically balls which will only fly five yards and you've got loads of big holes in them. Yeah. If you then spray hairspray onto, uh, not that I use hairspray, but you can spray hairspray onto the face and make a swing, it will make a contact point on the club face. Yeah. Now, if you're striking it from here, 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 and here, and here, it doesn't matter how good your swing is, that will not optimise. So then what you start doing is really start to feel in your hand and eye coordination. How can you get your hand and eye coordination to meet the sweet spot of that golf ball? So once you've got a reference point of saying, well, look, I actually tend to hit the ball uh, from this side of the club or this side of the club, it won't be all over the face. You'll have some spread, but the most the, the pattern will be one of the uh, error points over here. Now, in Mahindra's case, he's losing loads of distance but it sounds to me like he's got a very variable strike. He needs to get some cheap hairspray, spray it on, 
it then puts like a really sort of funny waxy coating on the face and any stripe becomes revealed on there. Yeah. So why did I answer that? Um, I think I might swing about with it in the back garden, wasn't it? How you optimize? So, I mean, this is what I was saying. Who did you say before about having the right knee, uh, the left knee replacement? Uh, Anthony was saying he's a, he's a below right knee amputee. Now, what Mahindra is saying here is I do not have any flexibility on my left ankle. Okay. So, that again, that's not a problem for, for, uh, for um, anybody, really. Um, in terms of the golf swing, it's obviously a problem in life, but in terms of the golf swing stuff, I have no sense of the bottoms of my left foot and my right forearm is broken. So that just shows you there, there's a guy who's battling sort of injuries at different parts of his body and still going to have to talk professional speed. So in your case, Anthony, uh, especially the most important thing you've written down here is saying that you've got no pain. Yeah, that means I would think that your body uh, is, has accommodated a new uh, arrangement. And it's not giving you any jip. It's it can now go on to, to, to perform the best way it can. All right, guys. Well, look. Um, any more questions? I'll wait a minute or two for you. Um, thanks ever so much for your input. It means a lot to me. Hi, Michael. Bit of a late entrance there. What time is it? <laughs> Only fifty eight minutes late there, mate. Oh, I thought you've been keeping quiet in the background. Uh, I've always struggled my short game. I try to use my 56, but most of the time it comes out hot. Very interesting. So hot, that's interesting. Uh, what would you suggest? Now, I assume uh, when you say hot, it's either coming out way too far um, uh, or it's coming out a bit too low. So if, whilst I'm talking, I'll, I'll cover both points. But if it's coming out hot, 58, and what I'm saying there, Michael, uh, is it coming out uh, hot as in too low? Or is it coming out hot in terms of... Um, uh, hi, darling. Say hello to the soldiers. Hiya. <laughs> uh, is it coming out too low? So if it's coming out too hot. At 58 degrees, that's a big problem, really. Because you've got such a soft, weak club in your bag that the 58 degrees, the measurement of the club's loft from here to here, really should deliver a stripe which is very much under the ball, and the ball travels upwards. If we take the starting point of loft on a golf club of a driver, say 9, 10 degrees on the world's best players, yeah? that means that when they strike it, all the energy and force at the back of the ball sends it forward. So if that's the optimal way, that's the optimal way to get the ball to travel the most distance. It's going to strike at the back of the ball and send it forwards. The more loft we put on it, even if we swing the same way, that sends the strike vertically and not so far forwards. So if you're sending the club out hot, my, uh, my, it's Michael, isn't it? That's it. Michael, yeah, fast and low, okay. You're sending the ball out and it's coming out hot. The first thing I do is look at, are you setting the club shaft correctly and vertically? One second. If the club shaft is vertical like that, it means you're showing the true cloth to the club of the ball. If you're 58 degrees, you're leaning forwards like that, that club might be sitting at 40 degrees, 48 degrees, whatever it might be, it's significantly less than what it should be designed to sit at. So if it sits vertically or slightly forwards, within range there, then that's the true loft of the club. Then what I'd do is I'd experiment a bit on the distance you want to hit the ball. So if I set myself up here, I start with a small position. I'm six foot two, but when I'm chipping, I've got my 58 degree out. I put my hand at the bottom of the handle, starts in a small position. So then my rehearsal swing for a short shot. I'll take my hands up in my right pocket, and then have some shots where I go to the right pocket, and just pop the club through. Now you look at me there. If I do that, I'm not going to send the ball a million miles, am I? Club shaft is vertical, I don't know if you can see that. Hands down the handle, rehearse back to the right pocket, and through. And the next thing I do, you can hear me, I've got a wooden floor here. As I swing, the club slides or bounces on the ground where the ball would be. And I assure you, Mike, if you do those two things, you will not hit the ball hot, right? So when I have a golf ball here, like that, if the club goes underneath it, like that, the ball jumps up in the air and lands softly. If I don't quite get below it, then what I tend to do is hit the ball thin, it comes out really low and fast here. So just an example of that, just give me a second here to find one of my favorite photographs. So this wedge shot here, this belongs to Tony Jacklin, you know, one of the world's best players of the 1970s and 60s. I'm going to get the angle right for you one second. 
Now you can start to see now just how many of his strikes come from the top part of the club of here. Loads come from here. Main body of strikes are here. So that means the club's going under the ball. So that's, that's a, a wedge. That he came to play at our club and I caddied for him. Took a photo of his wedge. And all those strikes there tell you that he puts the club under the ball. Like this. Yeah. So what I suggest for you, Michael, is set yourself up in the smallest position possible. Hands down the handle. Feet close together. And then when you make a swing, a little rehearsal swing, just goes back to that right pocket. Back to the right pocket. And then make a few swings. But by when you're swinging... You just clip the grass on the way down. So you set up in a small position. You've swung to a, a limited distance position. And then when you're swinging down, you get the club to make contact with the ground. And those sounds that I was making before are the club sort of sliding and bouncing on the ground. means the ball will jump up in the air very softly. And again, if you've got space in the back garden, it looks like you're putting your kids to bed. Um, if you've got space in the back garden, which isn't dominated by primary colored plastic like mine is, um, get the airflow balls I was talking about before. You'll see it earlier in the video. I was talking about the airflow balls. You can buy them very cheaply, uh, about two pounds for a packet of six online. They only fly five or ten yards. There's no sort of power to them. I just learned to get the airborne. Yeah, because once the ball's airborne, it won't come out fast, hot. And what it sounds like to me is that you're hitting the ball very thin. You don't go underneath it to get the ball to jump up in the air. So Anthony says, Neoc was only October, so I'm very hopeful. Well, good luck with that, mate. Uh, like I say, you got my number there. 07974403289. Have a good look at that. Um, send me a WhatsApp. Just some swing in the garden. Um, it gives me an idea then. So uh, your description of your swing and what I see of your swing won't always be uh, similar because uh, what you feel and what I see are different things, obviously. Um, but you've got the number. Give me a, a, just, just send me a WhatsApp video. I can respond to that quite quickly. All right, everybody. Well, listen, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in, Gene. Nice to see you. Hope you're wonderful. Can't wait to see you around Teddington sometime. Uh, Jean's one of the lovely lady members from my golf club, uh, where I used to work. Um, we live about uh, three streets. We see each other in the local restaurants and pubs. And or even sometimes in the gym. And being good. <laughs> All right, well, listen, thanks ever so much for tuning in, guys. Um, those of you who are watching this later on, a uh, big thank you to you as well. Um, we... Uh, yeah, we love dealing with you guys, uh, Alistair, Di, and I. That's I talk on behalf of the three of us uh, when I say that. You know, we're so patriotic and we're so grateful for what you do and what you've done, uh, and we love being around you. And uh, any time we can help you, then we will do. Uh, so you've got my number. You know where I am. Uh, also type in my email address. And you can just contact me whenever you want. All right, guys. Well, listen. It would be my absolute pleasure, Anthony. Um, good luck with left hip there, Alan. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. All the best. <laughs>